and it was after that, you, I mean, you remember Kumi Preku. Incidentally, uh -huh. this year is the 20th anniversary of the passage of the VAT Act. So Kumi Preku 98, you were at the VAT? You are the I Act. was the national coordinator for the VAT. Oh, so you were the one we were looking for when we were on the street. Oh, I, I, I was in secondary school, so so when Recruit Bobby and Cole were on the street, you were there. I, I happen to have worked closely with uh, Mr. Bobby. Uh, Tazan. Doctor, yeah, uh, on the energy, uh, the evolution of what has become the energy taxes. Oh, really? The rationalization, the pricing structure. There's a tax element. So I know him very well. Again, under <laughs> Mr. Toa Hoy, when he became okay, Minister for Energy. Okay, okay. And he was jointly responsible for the Structural Adjustment mm -hmm. Program, Institutional Support Program. All right. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> so yes. I, so this I is 98, you. when you were the head of the, the, the implementing team for VAT? Actually, I did start in 93, immediately after my, <clears throat> um, my master's program. Okay. I came in and then started working on the VAT. Okay. So I moved to work, you know, with George Blankson and then... Uh, our boss for the second round was Mr. Asamoah, who is a seasoned tax administrator. So we considered the VAT okay. <coughs> project, which became the VAT you know, service. So when, NDC, after that, that I so when NDC went into position from 2000 to 2008, what were you doing? I was at the fund. Went I, to I, joined, I joined the IMF. IMF. <coughs> yes, okay. in the middle of 1999, the Fiscal Affairs Department, and, okay. uh, which is mainly advice to countries which is more like a consulting more in the tax administration field but as an accountant i also took some interest in okay <coughs> in fiscal management wow and then uh, they come back so when mills won then you were brought in as deputy minister 2000 actually professor mills uh for the second round of the VAT reintroduction had become vice president and was okay. put in charge but i had worked you know um the VATs project was under the internal revenue service when he was first chairman and then mm. um and then later the commissioner mm -hmm. you know for the internal revenue service um and persuaded me to start teaching so you mills know, is like your team. mentor <coughs> in tax yes I tax must, policy yes mr ahoy you know um Atu uh, ahoy. Professor, Atu ahoy yes professor mills uh, let me mention dr butchie who was Christy minister butchie. you know then and um, my immediate superior in terms of ministerial on the uh, the mainstream ministry was uh, the late Paco Simsata. Oh, interesting. Yes. So there are two Ahoy, Mills, Butri, Emisata, or you worked under at I some point? I worked under, yes, at various points. Very interesting. Yes. I see. <clears throat> so you are, you are in, in terms of working in IMF, you are a, 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 a neoliberal economist. You believe in the IMF worldview. Well, the, the, I worked in the technical assistance, you know, one of the technical assistance divisions of the IMF, mm. which is the fiscal affairs department of the IMF. Uh, the work there is more practical on the ground, mm -hmm. you know, which involves tax administration, advising on tax administration, and, you know. Um, yes, but the fund, the fund has its, you know, um, <clears throat> the fund is a professional institution. And no, but you believe in the ideologies. For example, they they don't like subsidies. They, they I mean, you know, the IMF uh, the prescriptions I, the, the cuts I, your the deficits. The uh, way I put it is, can you afford the subsidies? I think it's it's more. Of, you have to look at it in practical. And Ghana is a very good example. Um, between twenty uh, fourteen and twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. We took advantage of the decline in crude oil prices, you know, to liberalize. And um, today we don't talk about petrol shortages. We don't talk about queues mm -hmm. for fuel. You have to go back to the last time was 2014, 2015, when we saw that. And mm -hmm. I recall very well somewhere in 20 June when there was a hiccup of 2015. That was mm -hmm. the last time. Uh, so the question is, and, and I think that uh, with high crude oil prices, you know, if we don't manage well, subsidies may come back, you know, will come back. But we also know that subsidies were among um, the, the things that brought down the state-owned enterprises and led to the ESLA, <coughs> you know, which we used to take off, you know, um, the energy sector or the energy sector debt, which was owed to the banks. 
So if you see, for example, in today's environment, imagine if you had subsidies, huge ones which are not being paid, the situation with the banks would have probably been worse. And so I think it's more of a balance. You know, my own belief is every economic system needs some social intervention because mm -hmm. there will always be vulnerable people in the economy. There will always be you know, low, very low-income people and use various instruments, you know, but it must be you know, targeted. If it's not targeted, then you overrate the extent to which the budget can support you know, those programs. And that is one of the biggest dangers in developing countries. You must, in implementing any project, the first question is, is my budget able to support it? The program can be popular. But is the budget able to support it? And that was the theme of the 2015 budget, was realigning you know, the budget. Because we had come to a point where subsidies you know, were virtually destroying state-owned enterprises, were virtually destroying banks. Mm. You know, and so you had to, to do something about it. This morning, we, we asked <coughs> uh, our listeners on radio how they were feeling about the economy. A lot of them said things were hard and that... Uh, cost of living was high for them and, and that kind of thing. When you read about the economy, we are told that things <coughs> have been stabilized and we are getting out of the woods. Does it sound familiar when Ghanaian economic actors say things are hard for them, when the people managing the economy say they've stabilized the economy and things are picking up, yet people can feel it? Is it very familiar just that this time it's not your business? Well, no, it is my business because, I, as I said, I, I consult and I do have a keen interest in what goes on you know, in the economy, so I follow, you know, as keenly as possible. Um, once in a while, I put my thoughts out there. But frankly, I, and not to sound too partisan, I, I would definitely have expected a better performance of the economy. And let me give my reasons, you okay. know, very tangible. We went through two and a half years of disruption mm. in gas supply from Nigeria. That's how long it took, um, leading to a downturn in the economy because power because of the power crisis. I think we oversimplified it with the word doom so. And therefore, um, <laughs> there wasn't, you know, those in government were analyzing it seriously, but I think a lot of people took it to be non performance by government, even though we all know it is uh, pipelines that were ruptured under sea and it had to take time to fix it. Mm -hmm. So that was one factor of the economy going down. Um, we had the positives, which is Jubilee, started generating some, you know, crude oil and revenue. Then we had the tariff bearing issues. Mm -hmm. um, later, crude oil prices slumped. So when crude oil prices were high and we were exporting, we created some buffers. We can talk about some of them. Mm -hmm. For example, the one uh, buffer I will talk about is the sinking fund and the stabilization fund, which we created. There is a practical... You know, we, we use our own oil resources, and it hardly happens in Africa. Our own oil resources, about 500 million of the oil re revenue, to take off a bond for the first time, a 750 million first sovereign bond. So these are the sort of instruments that you put in place to support, say, your borrowing. So you don't just, you know, borrow. So the long and short I'm saying is, then we put in ESLA, right? Now, the reason I'm saying that I would have expected the economy to perform better is that, first of all, the um, pipeline and the disruption in gas supply, if we are paying well, should restore power to the economy, and the economy should be doing, you know, better. Um, the second reason I would say is that we put ESLA in place, and ESLA is generating you know, one billion a piece for the energy sector, for energy sector debt, about one billion a piece for uh, the road, enhanced road levy, which could have been used also to, you know, um, do some refinancing of debt owing to contractors and to put something into the economy. So you can ask yourself, with 3.4 billion annually of SLA coming in, what is it that is? preventing payments of arrears and others. But a more important one is crude oil prices have rebounded at a time when we have brought 10 and Sankofa on string. And we are getting more crude oil at higher prices. 
and so you can see that you know there is some revenue flows into the economy then so you, you expect the economy to have been do, doing better compared to now. compared to the depressed states against the background of the global financial crisis okay let me read a couple yes, of yes. things to you <clears throat> about your your tenure yeah. so that so a, a couple of things the, the imf itself which you used to work for has a very interesting view about ghana's economy in analyzing your term so when they did their september 2017 review they they conclude by saying the new government faces significant challenges including a large fiscal slippage that occurred in 2016. so that's under you i wrote about the slippage. i'm coming addressing these <coughs> challenges calls for an ambitious adjustment and reform agenda so that's one then the finance minister your predecessor in speaking at a recent event last wednesday also says to be frank Despite the positive macroeconomic gains this administration has registered, we are still confronted with a huge debt left over by the previous administration. So, two things. The IMF in their 2017 Article 4 consultation say that because of fiscal, they call it fiscal slippage, overspending, within your time, there's, this government has new challenges, which the, finance, the new finance minister is admitting that they've been left with a, a, a huge debt so i want you to address those two things fiscal slippage according to the imf and your 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 the man who took over from you is also saying that you left him a huge debt he's still feeling it he's still solving it well first of all <clears throat> the arrears figure i wrote an article disputing it and i hope the fund you know will look at it critically what i'm saying uh because there are the seven billion does not fall into the strict definition of areas which we use what we were doing was and let me let me try and simplify it. what we define as areas are bills that were sent have been sent to the ministry of finance and have not been paid whilst you are looking at those bills the ministries are awarding contracts the ministries are completing contracts the ministries so you can't define your areas as bills that I have received in the last six months and then rest i took an accounting view mm -hmm. we went to cabinet and we said let's move to accrual accounting so we took an inventory and it's in the auditor general's report so you can see the auditor general admits that you know that compilation was actually something we started in the 2017 budget guideline which i signed mm -hmm. and i wrote a long article about it now we also showed i also showed clearly that having realized that the seven billion was not strictly definition of areas offsets were done they were not paid you know and i still stand for correction you know and for the ministry to come up and correct that view and for the first time you will see that there are two figures first time since 2000 mm -hmm. that you see the offset taking place and you see a different presentation of our fiscal numbers you know so i think that we should just come clean and if you remember the figure was mentioned as 11 billion that's the total value of contracts then it was mentioned as 7 billion then at a point at the new year school it was written down to 3.1 billion so what is the real so you dispute the claim that I you do, left a 7 billion I do, hole in the yes, economy i do dispute it and i have written and I, as i said i stand for so what was the figure that was what was the areas figure that you left the rest i wouldn't be in a position to to know because we had left office and they you know did a computation but it's closer to something around the two to three billion in the strict definition of areas what about debt <clears throat> how much debt did you leave for them i think if we take of course there's another dispute as to why you would use a match you know um uh, forex rate to calculate the numerator which is the debt for end december and use a gdp end december so you use match there's another mismatch you're, you're referring to <coughs> their claim that you left the public accounts billion, billion. Uh, 1.22 or is it one twenty? i don't think it's i don't think it's a claim because it has become no, i'm just trying to let people understand because you say it's one two zero and they say it's one two two no we are not saying it <laughs> let me explain the auditor general and accountant general are saying it's one one two zero the minister of finance is saying it's one one two, two zero two. yes 
And so the mis the mis offense is one two two. One two two. But you are saying the, the auditor general is saying one two zero. And the controller accountant general and the public accounts is also saying it's one two zero. If you read Honorable Veggies, you know that is where he was coming from. And so when the question was so how come there's a difference between you know the supervising ministry and the, the explanation came that you know because the budget was read in March, you know they took the March you know figure, but. Um, Bernard, you are an economist. There's a difference between stock. And so if you are taking value of a stock item in December, you use the exchange rate in December, which is what we have always done. If it's a flow, then when you are in March, you use March. You know, so how do you mix So by arriving at 1 to 2, they were not being fair to the way it is calculated. That's yes. your view. But yes. that's no, that is not... That, no, that, no, no, that, I'm coming. They're coming. People are saying, if you left 1 to 0 or 1 to 2, that's still a lot of debt. But I know this, so I'll come to that. But I'm saying that that itself, you know, it's, that itself is, is something. Remember, I had mentioned arrears, and I had mentioned, you know, this one as well, and other things which I don't want to. So I'm saying that, it, you know, the discretionary, you, you know, way in which numbers are being calculated now is something which we have to tackle through the public financial management. I think we misunderstand if we focus on debt as debt today. Right. We took a long term view. Ghana had debt of over 150 percent. We got into HIPIC and the debt came down to about 28 percent. The steepest increase in debt did not occur during MERS. It did not occur, you know, during uh, President Mahama. It occurred in the year immediately after we got HIPIC. And the graphs are there to show. I should have brought it if I knew. Mm. You know, yes. So I'm saying that the expansion in debt and fiscal deficit started right after hippie completion in 2004-2005. There is some positive in that some of it went into infrastructure development. But I'm saying that for one government to take a position, you know, that you left 70 when the thing goes up, by the time the MB was leaving, and I think we need to understand, otherwise we have become a middle income country. And we will be, yes, the, the debt had increased by 10 percentage points within the three to four years after HIPIC, before the left office, right, close to 40 percent. Then it started going up. In fact, if you take the nominal figure, which is what you know, they like to project 120 billion, you know, what? So we may want to now talk about nominal also. No. You talk of debt in terms of GDP, right? When you take, and again, the graphs are there, I presented them in Legon, you were in Legon. The first decline, major decline in the rate of growth of debt, which is what you begin to bring under control, occurred between 2014 and 2015. And at the smart growth. Uh, smart borrowing smart policies, borrowing. yes, that we implement. <laughs> and the graphs are there to I show. See. So it, I think it's, it's again... So it's not fair to just look at a nominal figure of 120 and say we inherited a lot of debt from <coughs> the previous administration without looking at where the debt came from and who reduced it. This is your argument. That's my argument. <clears throat> and for the same reason, that's why I say that we expect better because GDP has rebounded on account of Tenfield and... Uh, and Sankofa. I have so why is it that the economy is so sluggish? We have a I think we should look at the expenditure pattern. We should look at whether we are being over ambitious. With Fantastic. So Setekwa is saying he expects <coughs> or expects better or expected better than the performance that we have with this new government. We have questions around the difference in tax policy. The new government said they had abolished nuisance taxes, which they claim he had put up. We'll ask him questions around that. Who is to blame for the banking crisis as well? We'll look at some of those issues and then we'll discuss other issues on Ghana's economy. This is the point of view. Don't go away. your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation.
months because we're giving only those in their third trimester. So in the next three months, those in their second would be ready for to receive the kit. And we're taking data at registration, which is before they take the kit, at delivery and post-delivery so that we can analyze and we'll see the numbers. So from the numbers and the data that we're collecting, we would know what has worked, what hasn't worked, you know. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10. Let your voice be heard with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. Join us for Breakfast Daily, only on City TV. Go. Hello and welcome to another day, another week, and of course another episode of 30 Minutes. We're excited and we will be talking about all the trending conversations. Spend 30 minutes every weekday catching up with all the trending social media conversations of the day. If you tweet it, we'll read it. We might just even Skype you. Shata, why are you being so raw and hard like that? But yeah. at the particular time, that's what I want. That's I wanted yeah. to do it. But that doesn't mean you are my enemy. Sure. We can still meet again and shut up. This time we are about to do don't come and do that and nonsense. Okay, please I don't do it. And we'll give respect to each other. But sometimes I feel, you know, when we, we are all humans. When somebody says something about me, shut up, hey, no, 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 no. I might want to say something. Yeah. So but when I say it, people shouldn't take it like uh, taking things you know personal and stuff i've understood showbiz now and i really want to work on it like 30 this. minutes is all it takes so use the hashtag three zero minutes on social media to catch our attention join the most interactive social media tv show weekdays at 5 p.m only on city tv For regular news checks as they unfold. 2020 News. All day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business and more. 2020 News. We bring you the world in 20 minutes. And that's all the news in 20 minutes. Welcome back to The Point of View. My guest <coughs> is Seth Imano, Tech my former Minister for Finance. Indeed, he's been working in government for many, many years. He gave us a quick history of his life in government. He was the man in charge of implementing VAT 20 years ago when Kumi Preku hit the streets, uh, learned his trade under Atu Ahoy, Professor Mills, Kwesi Emisa Arthur, Kwesi Butri. And he ended his um, public service recently, 20 months ago precisely, as finance minister under John Dramani Muhammad. Here are some of your thoughts for him quickly. Good evening, Bernard. Interesting thoughts by Mr. Tekpe. I don't know how disruption in gas supply from Nigeria caused the deficit to increase astronomically. When will we all know when we all know unsustainable debt is what led us to IMF? Doesn't he think even if crude oil prices dropped coupled with gas supply distortions from Nigeria and they were prudent in their expenditure, things would have been far better, Kweku from Dansuman. Good evening, Bernard. I think one day you should bring these two gurus, Set Tekpe and Kenofriata, together. I don't know. I know they will have an intellectual discussion devoid of politics. This is Afeti from Teshinungwa. Elon from Bachona. Interesting. The guy was held, hailed for being a tax-driven finance minister as well as the bond gentleman. What does he think of the U-10 from taxation to production by the current government? Rashid Inusa says, Bernard, please ask him, to tell us his honest knowledge of the genesis of the current happenings in the banking sector as others are pointing fingers to their administration um good evening bernard please ask mr tekwe there was was there any government was there any government that could save the collapse of banks than merging them further from nigeria okay so let's just wrap up quickly on the issue of over expenditure in fact kweku from Dansuman is alluding to the same question i asked that the imf said that there was a, a lot of spending in 2016. I think we, I think we, I did a presentation myself in um, uh, Labadi Beach Hotel under the auspices of the graphic, yeah. you know, on election year expenditure and the okay. notion that during election years, and we showed it that yes, it does okay, and so we we're conscious of it and wanted to control it. I think we should, conf we should. If you want to control election year expenditure and others, you must understand the expenditure. And that is the effort at the seven billion that we were, we were doing. We were, in other words, we were, what we were doing was bringing out liabilities that are in sector ministries. 
which do not count as arrears, but which immediately after elections, immediately after the budget, actually, <clears throat> just pop up, and, mm. and, and for which you wouldn't have. And this is what, uh, pardon me for being technical, this is what <clears throat> countries that have become middle income do. Mm. They move from so-called cash, <clears throat> where you define the arrears as, you know, just three to six months, to get a handle on what your ministries are doing. And so we started what we call the contract database. And the contract database means that you cannot, you know, uh, award a contract without the Ministry of Finance knowing. And we had that database. That is 11 billion. And then other elements of it. We can have, you know, mm. a, a program to discuss this because I don't know. Now let me, let me just come to the link. When you have a disruption in gas supply, I think I mentioned it, but your listener <coughs> probably failed to. When you have disruption in gas supply for two and a half years, it is that gas which is generating power. So the immediate impact is there's no power. Mm -hmm. We all know them so. Output falls. Because, I mean, businesses are now operating at full capacity. Employees are being laid off, right? And so your revenue won't come. Mm -hmm. Because it's only when you have output that the taxes will be paid. Mm -hmm. But because, uh, again, so at the risk of, you know, uh, 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 sorry, at the expense of oversimplifying this, we did not. Now, let me also mention that many economies during that period went into recession, including Nigeria mm. and others. Ghana did not go into recession, despite all those difficulties that we're having. Crude oil prices and everything. And Gola and many countries went into recession. So it gets to a point where, as a manager, you have to manage problems. <laughs> you don't always, otherwise you would, you would pump just mere cities into the economy, right, without you doing the correction. So the correction had been done. Whilst we were doing investments in the 10 field, you know, the partial risk guarantee, which would ensure those investments are now on stream. And that is the point I was making in terms mm. of, and I'm saying therefore that if you have additional revenue coming from Sankofa, Additional revenue coming from Tenfield on account of crude oil, higher crude oil price, on account of, you know, and you have resolved to some extent the Jubilee issues and whatever and, okay. and all that, then your problem is probably no revenue. Great. And Let's, we must look at... No problem. Let's move into other issues quickly. Yes. The <clears throat> MPP government said they were moving from taxation to product, productivity. They listed the number of taxes you impose that they abolished. Permit me to read some of them, and then I'll take your comment on their tax policy. They abolished the one... If you, if you slow down, I'll explain to each one that you... you oh, it's a lot. I'll just put it together. It's too many. They, they, <coughs> they, they, they abolished 1% special import levy. It wasn't abolished. With okay. a so, it I, was 2%. They, they reduce it by 1%. The 1% still exists. Good. They so said 17.5% VAT NHL financial services. It's not gone. It's still we all know that it's the two and a half percent which has been turned into a levy. No, this is financial services. No, it was no core financial services, and that is the tax the IMF requested should be brought back, which had, was had been turned into the levy, which is an albatross. But it's not seventeen point five; it's lower. Let me explain this. You see, when we talk about expansion of the tax base, when we talk about expansion of the yeah. tax base, we tend to put all the focus on the informal sector. Mm -hmm. But remember that services are stripped agriculture yes. and even industry, and it's about fifty percent. Okay. Now, when agri was dominant, cocoa and others, when industry was dominant, your tax those were your tax handles. Mm. So the sector that grows, you have to develop tax handles. You mm. know to you know. So what we were doing was to say, look, there is a sector of the economy that is growing, and it is outside the tax net. Let us bring it into the tax net. We were not taxing savings. The tax was on the non-core financial services because savings is you've earned the income and you've put it right. in. So that's yes. your comment on that. Seventy point five percent VAT NHL on selected import, imported medicines that are not produced locally. No, there was there was, there was exemption already. Remember, I was a NHL is collected as though it were VAT. Okay. So there's, there's an exemption already for Good. basic... They say they've also abolished 17.5% VAT NHL on domestic air tickets. Well, yes. That's, that one has been abolished. Yes, but that's another expanding sector of the economy. Five? We have only one domestic airline. Now, no, no, at the time it wasn't just one. And it was... It was a, Can it we say maybe because it was the taxes that drove the rest out? Because we had Starbo, we had Hour, we had Antrac, now we have only Hour. 
and now passion is coming. So could we could we say the decline in the aviation you know, some, some, industry was because of taxes? No, I, I don't think that you that, know some of those airlines. Well, there's a balance that has to be done. And remember, we had looked at aviation fuel and others when we were in power. You know, to assist the, the okay. industry. No problem. Five percent VAT any child on real estate sales abolished. Excise duty on petroleum. Special petroleum tax rate reduced from 17.5 to 15. That's 2.5 percent reduction. So why not 17.5? I don't know. You should ask them. But that's, at least they reduced yeah. it. So what I'm saying is that you levies imposed on Kayaye by local authorities. They remove, they claim. That was a local government tax. It was a central government tax. Taxation gains from realization of securities <laughs> listed on Ghana Stock Exchange. Then they said they reviewed the national electrification scheme levy from five to three percent, reduced public lighting levy from five to two percent. I, I think we can. I think we can split heads. No, I'm saying that if no, no. all this together, they're saying that the taxes were imposed were nuisance and they reduced them. No, I'm saying that let's not split heads. The substantive taxes are still in place. Most of what has been done is cosmetic. You know, the, the temporary taxes which we were going to take away, remember there was a promise to take out ESLA. ESLA, as I said, is generating $3 billion a year, $3.4 billion annually. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can say that ESLA, right, solution-oriented. It could have been classified as the most new source of all taxes. Why is it being retained? Because... If you fail to see the problem in opposition, you come into government. I think I think what is required rather is an apology to Ghanaians, you know, that we didn't, you know, appreciate. And that takes us to the banking sector crisis. Remember that the first refinancing of the banking sector debt was a state-owned enterprise debt, which arose from the uh, crude oil, high crude oil prices, non-payment of subsidies, mm -hmm. you know, which we negotiated with 12 banks, mm -hmm. about 12 or 13 banks. And we did a restructuring. So it's not, it's not also true that, you know, we did not tackle the banking uh, in answer to one of the questions. Yes, we did see it, because there were audits, right? And we did it. We restructured two billion, you know, of the banking sector debt. And that was with a mere 350 million. Today we are talking about three billion. So again, my question, should we expect more? Because but, but, you, are, you are collecting, I mean, I'm saying... Since, you, since you jump into the bank thing, let's, let's go there. there. There are a number of reasons why the banks collapse. Inadequate capital was one. Poor corporate governance was another. Weak supervision by Bank of Ghana was a third. And then some, we are told, obtain their license through false pretense. And then high insolvency. I think Bank of Ghana has addressed some of these issues. For example, they are, they are enhancing banking supervision. They are bringing in ethics. They are looking at the question of adequacy, and they are working on, you know, the issues of fraud and the rest. So, so Bank of Ghana is handling some of these things in terms of their internal. The issue is liabilities, both private sector, you know, uh, uh, loans that are not paid and public sector loans that are not paid. And this is a this is a crux of the matter where I'm saying that, you know, it is also not true to say that. You know, we saw a crisis and we did not attend to it. After all, the 10 billion, you know, and the extension of the ESLA for 10 years, which we were doing three to five years, you know, is a measure that we put in place. You may not want to give credit, but acknowledge that, you know, it is contributing significantly. And so, so what could on. have been done? Let me just understand something. The asset quality review of the banks was done in 2015, showed significant vulnerability <coughs> of some of the banks. Eight banks were identified to exhibit significant weaknesses with capital adequacy ratios between 10 and some below 5, and some nearing collapse. You knew about this as a government, because this is from 2015. What did you do to prevent the banking collapse based on Let's the information read. Let me read from you got the, from the Asset Quality Review Let me read in 2015? From the, let me read from the ESLA report, not signed by me, okay. even though we implemented the utilization of the bond of the bond would help reduce the profile of non-performing loans within the banking sector and consequently strengthen the balances of the SOEs in the sector. To date, the stock of energy sector debt has been reduced by over 40 percent. ESLA PLC will continue to issue bonds in due time to completely pay off the legacy debt. Now, the 2016 you know, report acknowledges for VRA a similar thing. 
the goal was to restructure VRA's legacy debts, which has been a major impediment to the smooth operation of VRA's business and by extension, blah, blah, blah. It goes on to say that the debt overhang had also exposed the banking sector to the possibility of a systemic risk as the magnitude of the exposure weighed heavily on the asset quality, you know, of the banks. So the, the, the asset when, quality was based on the exposure. No, no, let me go back to the SLI. Excuse, you are saying, I'm just trying to understand. You are saying that this point that the 2015 review revealed was caused by the exposure of the banks to energy sector debts. Energy sector debt, but also, remember, SLI, the focus is often on the energy element. The three billion I mentioned includes the enhanced road levy, which was going to be used to take off the largest of government debt, which is the road. So your solution at the time, based on the 2015 review, was the ESLA? Because the ESLA was passed in 2015. And I'm saying that both reports, after we left, you know, signed, has acknowledged that. I agree. But I'm saying that when you listen to the Bank of Ghana, they don't really mention the exposure to energy sector. So it appears maybe what you said addressed. Well, but I'm talking about the seven banks. So just, just a quick second. So ESLA address the energy exposures. I'll give you another issue. Fina trace debt, right? Royal Bank came out two days ago to say that the reason they collapsed was that the Fina trade did not pay them. And Fina trade was not an energy debt. If you permit me to read, the Royal Bank in a response to the Bank of Ghana after it was consolidated with four other banks pointed out that Fina trace one billion CD debt affected their operations. And this is contrary to assurances you gave in 2016 in an interview with us where you said that Ghana's banking sector will remain strong and effective despite claims of imminent collapse due to the huge debt owed banks by Fina Trade, a commodities company. This was an interview I did with, with Suhini, I believe, some time ago. Yeah, you said that. Yeah, so so the, the, the question is, yes, ESLA dealt with energy exposures, but Fina Trade came out last week, this week to say that, it was, sorry, uh, Royal Bank came out to say that the Fina Trade debt helped India collapse. No, I'm saying that. You know, the point I'm making is, we can go to, you know, individual specific, and Fina Trade... I recall was a cuckoo body suit that was being, you know, um, uh, handled. But I'm saying you can point to financial, you can point to energy sector, you can point to, you know, uh, 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 government areas, you can point to various things. And I'm saying the impression that nothing was done, ESLA was passed in 2015. After we did the first restructuring, we had a term sheet. We had a term sheet for a second restructuring right which was put aside for over a year before the bond because remember the bonds the 10-year bond was done in 2017. we had a term sheet which was going to take us so the revenues that came in you can see that the utilization of the 2016 bond in the report that was issued refer excuse me refers to vra it does not refer to any measure that was taken in 2016 that's 2017. That's true. But my question is, yes. is that you, you, are, you, you keep happening on ESLA. That what led to the bank collapse was not just a question of a bond coming to support banks that face insolvency. They speak, for example, about poor supervision, right? Now, and I know you don't do bank supervision as finance ministry, but there were alarms about how the banks were operating. And you were in government. You worked closely with both Wampa and Nashiru. If you read some of the reports about what happened at banking supervision, is there not a collateral damage for the government? Because there were many meetings, in fact, we've seen times where the finance team, you, the vice president, the president, the governor, met to discuss the economy. Is it not a disgrace that under the governance you worked with, banking supervision allowed banks to do the crazy things they did? If you read the reports of PwC, of Boulder's advisors, and of KPMG, it's very clear that Banking supervision was very weak. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, you see, I, I, I think individual feelings is not, you know, you know, so relevant as what policies were put in place. Now, Bernard, you will recall during the amendment of the Bank of Ghana, and that's an issue which, as a nation, we must face. During the amendment of the Bank of Ghana Act, you recall the debate, independence, autonomy of the central bank. Even the minister, the deputy minister who was on the, gov on the board of the central bank was to be removed. And at those, you recall that there were banner headlines which said that I was fighting, you know, the central bank. Right? So I'm saying that, and many of these recommendations came from the very, some of the institutions that are criticizing, you know, today. I mean, elsewhere, there is 
oversight, at least parliamentary and other oversight, you know, of the central bank. Okay. Now, I'm saying that as far as the, the issue, and I address that, I said there were here supervision issues, there were other, you know, critical issues that were, but there were the more critical issue that was lead, going to lead to the imminent collapse of the banks was a heavy, you know, unpaid debt. Some of which you have mentioned. I'm saying that you can, you can see that for a measure that was put in place that is bringing in three billion, it is, bring, it is brought in three billion, right, in two years. Then we can estimate that is an average of uh, 1.5, let's say even 1 billion. Then for the 10 year bond, couldn't we have projected? Because it was going to bring 10 billion to have moved in early, mm. you know, given the potential of the ESLA, which we pointed out, you know, to have used it. But to not to it. overstretch the issue, a lot of Ghanaians will say, fine. You go and borrow to support banks <coughs> who are owed various amounts of money. How, how does that tackle the root cause? Because when you borrow, we pay eventually as the public. So if you, and the, your, 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 the man who took over from you, I don't know if you are his predecessor, so he's the one who, uh, he's also going to borrow 2.2 billion to support GCB. He's going to borrow again another, in fact, he's going to borrow in total 8 billion to fill the hole created by these banks. So it, it appears both of you and agree that think that when financial sector people create a problem, you go and borrow money that we pay back. Well, which, 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 and so my question is, if you say you, you, you borrowed, did you think of punishment for those who misbehaved? Because if, if and unless you're telling me that within the period that you were in office, it was not clear to you that some of the banks had done things that bordered on criminality. Yes, we agree that they were owed and they were not paid, but that was not the only problem, right? Yeah. So some of the, I mean, for example, somebody got liquidity support, you know this. They spent liquidity support to go and buy a license for another bank. Liquidity support, which was supposed to be used in a specific way, was diverted into other things. And this happened. So you, you can't tell me that borrowing or a slab bond is the magic bullet for the banking crisis. No, Bernard, you know, you take overall responsibility as I was minister. No, no question about the fact that, you know, you have to look for solutions on the overall you know economy let me repeat the imminent danger that we face coming out of you know the subsidy era out of you know the depressed economy and others was some imminent collapse now we did not just impose taxes in our case it was it was as large as a tax mm -hmm. we put other measures in place for example when the restructuring was done we use VRA's balance sheet to do the restructuring. Mm -hmm. And in anticipation of Ten and Sankofa, we had said that any revenues that are going to be generated in future should come and reinvest the taxpayer. Okay. Because we are not going to leave that, you know, to the SOEs mm -hmm. after you had restructured them. You know, so that's why they were put on the failing which government would consider the payments made on behalf of the ta taxpayer as injection of equity into the, the entity and they were to revert to the payment of profits and whatever. So yes, we did have, I was very mindful, you know, of course, if, if you are in charge of the budget and you have to go and borrow, and I recently said that, you know, to, 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 for the restructuring, especially private sector debt, mm -hmm. right? Because you can say subsidy, for example, is government policy that led to it, to private sector. Then of course, you know, you must put in measures to make sure that when the correction is done, and this is what was done in the advanced countries, if you remember. When they faced their own banking crisis, when they created the bad banks, you know, when they did quantitative easing and others, to bring recently, no, not too recently, anyway, the, um, the Fed in the U.S., the profit they made turned it over to the Treasury. The same thing with the United Kingdom. So I'm saying that, you know, the advanced countries and others face this, you know, crisis. But it is the measures you put in place. Mm. Yes. And I'm saying here that measures were put in place. Yes, criminality and others were, going, were taking place. But in terms of the health of the banking sector, mm -hmm. I'm saying there were flows of nearly $2 billion that had been sitting for over a year. Mm. Right? 
after attempts it was presented without okay you know any I, 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 I need to tell viewers that this is still the, the point of view we're talking to set tech but we've been running through a couple of issues the banking sector being a key one debt strategy taxes and i have a few more questions that you are sending <coughs> and, read. and of course i've been given an extra 15 minutes so i'm going to take my time and allow mr techway to address them i have a final point on on the banking sector and i move on to something else so one, one and minority member has said something that has got a lot of interest at mr dongo has said that if ndc comes back to power they will return the banks to their original owners i'm not sure whether you've heard that and whether you endorse such a position because you here you are talking about what you try to do to address the situation before you left office now, a member of a minority who is one of their spokespersons of finance is saying that they will, they will return. Is that his personal view? Is that the view of the NDC? Well, as far as I know, um, the minority normally comes and when they come out, they do their statements. Uh, you can't deny, you know, people from expressing their... Let me, let me just put it this way. I haven't seen a statement from the party, of the, for, from the minority, expressing explicitly this mm -hmm. position. I recall that when the minority, the minority was the first to ask the government to come clear last year. In fact, the IMF report that you read, please go back and read the fourth review. It hinted at the fact that we may have to borrow. And the minority had said the government, the statement was issued. Now, when the, uh, the first two banks, you know, came, the minority statement said we did not know enough. You know, to come to a position. So, is it responsible for a leading member of the minority who speaks on economics to be saying things like, we'll return banks to the original owners when we all know what led <coughs> to the bank collapse? Is that not irresponsible I, comment? No, I'm saying that I am not, I'm not aware that it's an official position, you know. Even if it's a personal and position. It's not to, it's, it, I mean. Well, I, I guess, Mr. Mr. Dongo adduce, you know, some reasons, you know, for, you know, and, and he spoke at length before coming, you know, to that. He may have been privy to some information which, you know, I'm not. I think that Mr. Dogo is somebody who does not shy away from media. And maybe do you, he and do you to endorse his position? That you will I mean, I, I, I'm asking because you, you've managed the economy. If somebody is trying to resolve a banking crisis and, and a leading member minority says that they will return the banks to the origin, it almost appears as if the banks have been forcibly taken. Meanwhile, you are saying there was a 2015 report about the challenges in the banks. I've already said that, you know, as far as uh, the opposition is concerned, you know, we always have recourse, you know, to former positions of the party or the minority, which is a spokesperson. And I, I haven't, you know, seen, in any case, the issue is a court. You know, the, the issue is a court. And we may want to see, I think it's one of the things we may want to see, some call it expropriation, some call it, so there's a lot of you know, analysis and views that has to come. You know, the courts will have to take a position, you know, on, on many of these issues. Uh, personally, let me answer by saying, giving you a straightforward, I do not have enough information yet. Right? A lot of information has come out. You know, but I don't have conclusive, I don't have information to come up with a very conclusive, you know, uh, position. Okay, you asked me to read something. Let me read something <coughs> again for you. And I'm reading IMF because you worked with them for a lot of many, many years. In March 2018, they're saying that macroeconomic situation has improved. GDP growth estimated at 7.9% in 2017, picked up after several years of economic slowdown, also reflecting increasing oil production. Consumer price inflation declined. Bank of Ghana reduced monetary policy rates by 550 basic points. Then let me read the other point. The 2017 fiscal target was successfully met. Overall deficit declined by more than programmed. Debt to GDP ratio declined on the heels of strong fiscal performance. Government made progress in implementing structural reforms, including drafting regulations for Public Financial Management Act, strengthening payroll controls, and reconciliation of areas between the energy sector, state owned companies, and the government. That, are these things. What we are reading now were all our policies. That was my you question. So, you, you, so it, it should be attributed to you, not to them? Well, no, I, I think that. But this is March, this is March 2018. Yes, but, but it tells you that the fund goes back. And I was just going to make the point that if you had read, you know, prior um, uh, reports of the fund, they will be pointing to the global financial crisis. They will be pointing to what governments should be doing, you know, at the time. Secondly, Ben, I just want to say, secondly, yes. I have spoken about the prospects for the economy. 
I hope that you you, you bear me out. Is it because I'm, I did? I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm asking this because you said that they should have done better. And I'm, some of the things I'm reading are twenty. For example, you said the 2017 fiscal targets were successfully met. This is 2017. Overall deficit <laughs> declined by more than program. Well, I have. I have. Debt to GDP ratio declined on the heels of strong fiscal performance last year. This is still 2017. The government comfortably financed its needs through domestic borrowing without resorting to borrowing from the BOG. This is still 2017. Then they say the government made progress in implementing structural reforms. Which then we can attribute to you because structural reform doesn't happen in a year. No, it's a continuation. Include, but I'm saying that in terms of the specific things like um, borrowing, economic growth, inflation, fiscal target, all of this has 2017 specific. Let me. Let me. If I said the uh, government recorded the first primary surplus since 2003. Actually, the primary surplus, domestic primary surplus, we achieved it in 2013, 2013, 2014. So again, that is one of the results some of the... So if I you talk, if you talk about the barrel, the well, no, no, I'm saying that, no, the, the table is there, and I can show you. Okay. But the, yes, but let me, let me make a point. Go ahead. I am not about to sit here and say that there hasn't been growth in the economy. Okay. When we did most of the investments, that is leading to that growth. Okay. I'm not about to deny that there has been growth in the economy, and therefore deny investments in Sankofa. The uh, deny sorry the investments in private sector, but what enabled is the uh, uh, what the partial risk guarantee, for example, that we did. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to sit down and deny all the investments that has been made in social infrastructure, you know, and the uh, the developments. Everybody knows that our government was, you know. So yes, we do also take credit for you know the a substantial part of the and and it can be borne out by the fact that much of the growth is oil growth. Mm -hmm. Non-oil sector of the economy is a bit sluggish, right? So I'm saying that we implemented quite a number of reforms, and governments being succeeding other governments, right? Governments succeeding other governments should expect that some of these policies, like the gift miss and the rest, which are strengthening and and leading to fiscal management. When the yeah. MPP took <clears throat> over, this is 23rd January. Government closed down 1,985 of its accounts out of the 4,000 it holds with banks. They call this the measure before. Yeah, they call this the Treasury single account. Is this a policy you endorse? And why yes. didn't you do? Why didn't you do? Why did you take? I mean, you no, no, we initiated it. How many accounts did you close? We, we closed, because they they had 4,000. They closed thousand. No, no, many of these many of these accounts were identified before we left. That's the point I'm making. It is part of the gift miss reforms. This part of the so did you close any made. accounts? Yeah, we so, did. It, so it was your intention to do the same treasury single account? Thing. We started. I'm saying that not intention. We started the treasury single account. The law? Not the law. The well, practical. The pra because the law was passed no, we, in 2016. So that I... I, I no, no. We I, had been implementing... Public Financial Management Act 2016. But did you close any accounts? The public... Excuse me. The yeah. Public Financial Management uh, Act itself, which is a consolidation, is part of the gift miss reforms. Because you can't do reforms without backing them by law. And so for the first time, we put in budget responsibility provisions. You know, we put in uh, measures on debt management and other, you know, uh, treasury management, cash management. So many of these measures, you know, yes. And I, I must say that it's to the credit of the government that they are continuing with, you know. Local banks complain about the treasury single account. They say it will affect their liquidity. Well, you can interpret treasury single account in a very physical sense. Which we did not. Physical sense in the sense that all the money must be put into, you know, one location. You can interpret it in virtual terms. That at the end of the day, all our government accounts must be closed by whoever is holding the government account. And the following day, you release it. Government loses balances, and government will therefore prevent you from using their money to go and buy treasury bills, which is. Which is what you're trying to prevent. Which is our own so money. So people were gaming the system. Yes. And you wanted to stop that. Of course, you have to stop it. You, fa you faced opposition for a lot of things you did from some people in your party. And opposition also played politics with it. Now that they are doing the same thing you did, how do you feel about it? In a sense that some of the... Po like, for example, this f uh, fiscal uh, public financial management act was initiated under your tenure. You are saying treasury single account started under you. Yet a lot of people fought you, I'm sure. Let me, let me, let me, how do you feel about let me, Let me tell you one experience, <clears throat> one thing from my experience. I told you that very early, I stepped into a career with a group of people who were implementing significant change. Two examples. Taking the revenue institutions out of the civil service, 
making them autonomous was not popular. Right? Today, despite some you know, edges that have to be smooth, everybody agrees that GRA is performing much better. But we are tw 25 years old. I just mentioned virtual letters. I was young then. You know, everything is possible when you are young. We face Kumi Prekum. VAT has become the most stable of the tax sources in Ghana by doing away with the sales tax. And that's why it's unfortunate some of the things that are being done with a stable tax base like the VAT. 20 years on. And I joined the fund where I was in a department that did structural adjustments. So when I look at measures like Exim Bank, Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, you know, a Treasury Single Account, and those measures that we put in place, some of these were experience I gained you know, from working in the Eastern European countries when they were acceding to the EU. Some of the things that they had to do. Some of these were things I gained or learned from middle income countries, countries that were becoming middle income. There is no single middle income country that hasn't got an exim bank. And the question we pose then is, you know, with Korea with my team, how can we have Turkish exim, Korea exim, China exim, US exim, count them, we counted about 13 all wanting to give us loan. And what it means is that they are just exporting their products to Ghana. Why don't we also have our Ezim Bank, you know, to also look outward? And so, in short, I'm saying that I, do, I don't, based on my view, I don't take a short-term view of structural reforms. And so... Even if the political cost means losing an election? Of course, I'm not saying that's why you lost, why you lost. but I, even, if it, even if it means that, well, it's good you, you, that you get opponents within your own party who ask the president to sack you many times because you are affecting their, their prospects. I think the president is being vindicated today by many of those things. He's been, you know, but he, he lost no, the election. I mean, why is he vindicated? Well, he, he lost it. Remember, again, I, talk about it, I, I spoke about the simplification of Dumso. You know, for example, you know, I, and it's, it's, it's real, right? You couldn't fix a pipeline. You know, remember they kept postponing the date and other things. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the electorate, you know, is often, um, um, you know, rightly so. They won't change. And we're going through downturns and others. And I'm saying that what our expectation is that the economy would have done. And when you are managing an economy in a downturn, it's not like an economy in an upswing, right? And therefore, you, don't, you, you should expect that there will be criticisms. For some of the so when, when people blame you and your policies for the NDC's fortunes at the poll, how, how do you respond to that? Because I said they say <coughs> it's the economy. So if it, at the end of the day, when people want to vote, it's the economic circumstance. So irrespective of everything else, noise, corruption. If they say you were running the economy, and because people felt the economy was not doing well, whether it was doom saw or whatever they, they said, it, it, would you accept the blame? I. I prefer to leave these things to posterity. Sometimes you don't, you don't respond, you know, immediately or overreact, you know, uh, immediately. But the thing I'm saying is that how many of those policies have gone away? And that's the, the point. And I think today, you know, we all know that um, um, President Mahama has declared, right, and the policies are being implemented. Today as we speak, for example, we have money in the second fund. It's not being used to, to do any buyback. I stand for correction again. We created a, the sinking fund. We use it to take off the first sovereign bond. Right? But there's money in the sinking fund for some reason, like the banking ESLA procedure, it's not being used to. And it is worsening the. Because if you use this, the money in the second fund to buy back your bonds, you'll be reducing the debt. You can see. So I you can say Mahama has been vindicated. Is it a good idea for him to run again? Is it a good idea for Mahama to run again? I believe strongly that you know he has experience to run. He has a he has a foresight. He has a lot of policies which he has put in place. I, I can say that you know firmly. You know that he's you know there are others who are in the race, but I'm saying you can see his record is clear, right? Ultimately, it's his personal decision, which he has made. Would you support him? To me? Do you support him? Do I support? Do you support his <clears throat> candidature? There's Joshua Labi, there's Sylvester Mensah, there's um, 
Spiogabra, there's even Guzitano now. We don't even know if Fosibotu is coming. Who do you, do you, do you think Mahama should be given the nod? I, I believe, what I believe is President Mahama has credentials which will make him win. You know, that I believe. Because I, 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 it's not about the personality of President Mahama per se. It is about the policy, some of which, you know, I work on very closely, you know, with him. And to that extent, I say that I have all the conviction, you know, that he can do, you know, a better job, you know, in managing the economy. The economy is a middle income, you know, economy. And I think we demonstrated with the institutions and structures that we put in place, you know, that, you know, we have the way with them. So, yes, I do endorse his decision, you know, to run, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and against the field. And I know a lot of the, the, the people, almost everybody who is running, because I've been you know, around for a while, ultimately to be about programs. So if if Kusibu, if Kusibu Chiu runs, would he be a good candidate for president? You worked under him too? Yes, I did. Would you support him? It's about programs. Or is Bahama and <coughs> who, can, who can lead the NDC for 2020? <laughs> it only tells you that when you're asking me this question, that means that you know, the NDC is not lacking choices. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Bernard. Good, to, have, good to have Tepe on your show. Uh, please ask him his view on printing of more currencies to produce locally, as suggested by panelists on your show some time back, Jonas and Hiyaku. Bernard, good evening. Inflation, we've gone through it before. He's saying that money is these days numbers, so you can jack up the numbers. We'll do that discussion later. I won't yes. go there. Bernard, good evening. <coughs> Kindly ask him for me, is Ghana beyond aid feasible now? This one has short answers. Ghana beyond aid, this is what the president is saying. Homegrown policy. The realization is that we are a middle-income country and we are not going to get it the way we used to get it anyway. And that is the theme of the homegrown policy. So it's your policy that so you change the name? I'm only saying that... Add, we... add policies. <laughs> <laughs> so Nalado has taken your homegrown policy from St. T and he has converted it to Ghana beyond it and he's trumpeting it about. I'm saying that. I'm, say, I'm, saying, I'm saying the realization no. which... Ghanaians have to appreciate mm -hmm. that we have become a middle income country. Yes. And with Tenfield, with Sankofa, and an expanding services sector in particular, despite the sluggishness, our per, per capita income is not likely to go below the thousand. And so, so we are stuck. So, so Ghana we Beyond Aid has is, is, is been there already. It's about the programs. I, I don't believe that Ghana Beyond Aid is about implementing programs that would consume our crude oil revenues. No, we are, I don't believe. So is that. it a good idea, Ghana Beyond Aid? I'm saying that what is necessitating Ghana Beyond Aid is the fact that we have become a middle-income country, which and we must plan in your tenure. Exactly. So Ghana Beyond Aid is your program that they have changed the name. I am saying that we. Saying, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me move on. I'm just. I'm just. Good. Can you please ask Mr. Tekpe the ghost names that were removed by Snate, whether they will follow to see the people who were withdrawing those monies. Snit announced today that they... Re uh, let me just show you the paper. Um, Snit saves 18 million after deleting 836... 8,366 I, 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 I don't want to do... I don't want to sit here and every little measure in fiscal management, I would say that I had a hand in it. But I think... But I want to for you. A, no, where I have a hand in it, I authorize the controller and accountant general not to issue a separate ID number and to use SNIT. Why? Because SNIT has a mechanism already. And there was a, and I got this out of an Professor Mills made me chair as deputy and Dr. Dufour, which was going to unify a national identification number. And remember I've been a tax administration and believe in national identification number even for tax compliance. Mm. We ended up doing the tax. So yes, this is a very you know positive step. But I'm saying that the Credit to the government, they are implemented it, implementing it. But if you know, uh, 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 we will be truthful about it. This is part of the give based measures. Let me read more comments. Uh, Unibank misappropriated over a billion cities. A little over a billion was advanced to them as liquidity support. UT and Capital Bank abused liquidity support, which could have kept the banks afloat if not sustainable. What has Esla Bond got to do with this criminality? In any case, let's check the composition of Esla Bond. <coughs> To total, let's check the composition of Esla bond 
to total NPLs in the banking sector. 100% of this debt couldn't have saved most of the banks, likewise government debt. It's clear this is because loans from deposited funds were garnered to cronies and couldn't be retrieved. I don't deal with absolutes, right? And, and I, I don't think the point I was making is that ESLA is a solution to everything. Remember, I spoke about other things which even the Bank of Ghana is tackling. I'm saying that nonetheless it is part of the and we could you know look at it you know critically mm. you know and how it is being. for example why do we cap why do we cap the esla for other uses you know when we have okay you know yes i don't want to go in but good evening mr uh Avle. is mr tekbe saying they were controlling expenditure in 2016 why then did they increase total national service allowance award contracts sign contracts employ news public servants etc was that done to make the new government unpopular then I think their government did not want the country, did not have the country at heart. Eric in Accra. Bernard, <clears throat> remember, and I stand for correction, I was the first minister to go to parliament to revise a budget downwards in 2015 and downwards in 2016 in an election year when the crude oil prices fell. Right? When the crude oil, I think this is there for everybody. So you may revise your expenditure downwards. It doesn't mean that the employee who is entitled to some, and you know the battles with, we had with uh, 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 under single spine and 10 minutes and bringing it down, which we did in conjunction. It doesn't mean that public uh, employees should not be entitled to their due, right? The fact that you are doing a correction, there's something. More else. questions so for you. We are sense. ending in the next four minutes at a quarter past uh, the hour. Granted, your revenue decreases due to gas supply and fall in crude prices. Why was expenditure increasing? I don't get it. Why not just reduce expenditure also just to compensate for I just said that we reduce expenditure. This question is just coming. Okay, quick for we did, okay. Yeah, we did reduce expenditure. But remember, government is a major player in the economy. Right? And so there's only a limit to the expenditure that you can. Otherwise, you're not going to be paying public servants. Okay. You're going to be. You are going to, you are not going to be paying. But the next. Okay, no problem. And, Hello, and and so, sorry. And so you take. When you are in such a situation, you don't take a single year view of the economy. Okay. Because the prospects were there. You know, that it would, you know, uh, the economy will rebound. A few, a few more questions for yeah. you. Hello, Ben. I said this right. He is visionary and a becoma and a Casfordian from UCC. He has the courage to take bold decisions. I'm also the same. Acquisition from Kumasi. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Lodjan, I seem for Sue Bernard. Good evening. Please ask him if it's true that some banks got their license within one week, like it's been claimed by the BOG. Why do they give those struggling banks money and refuse to monitor their activities? Michael is asking. Um, okay, let me end with a, a question about. Okay, so this morning we're asking whether we are in a recession or a credit crunch or what, because a lot of people are complaining. And then this story that we have in the graphic um, this is the head of Africa Research at Standard Bank, who says growth is at a 22 month low for private sectors here in Ghana. And he says, Ghanaian private sector growth has lost the momentum it started the year with slowing down to a 22 month low in july according to the july 2018 edition of the stambic bank ghana purchasing managers index the report indicates that new orders rose at a much weaker pace and the rate of expansion in output was only marginal and then it starts giving the details where are we in the economy are we is this an independence? This guy is. <coughs> this guy. This story is written by Theo Philos. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm posing. I'm posing. This is a big guy. I'm posing a question and answer. Yeah. Is this, you know, some independent view of my view of my position that the economy could probably have been doing better, given the fact that even the global economy, which was in a downturn, is in a rebound. The emerging economies are in a rebound. You know, advanced economies are in a. So I'm saying that this vindicates. You are saying this vindicates. No, I'm, I'm, no, I'm drawing attention to the fact that there is something systemic that is going on, and I've expressed some of these views already. Let us look at the expenditure pa patterns. Let us look at the promises. Let us look at, you know, are they sustainable? It's really is sustainable. sustainable. I think I've expressed a view on that, and I don't have a reason, you know, to change my mind on it. No, I don't. I don't remember your view. <laughs> it's free as it is good. Free as it is. Yes. yes. It's, it's, good, good it's good for the vulnerable. It's good for but the vulnerable. But I think in every economy, you don't give goodies to people who can pay, you know. Um, can the economy handle it? <clears throat> I doubt. So if you were... Because at the moment, we've done capping of statutory funds. We've done... Uh, the, the bulk of ABF is going into free SHS. You know, we've admitted that we need more infrastructure. 
we have other sectors that are not receiving. So don't get me wrong, I've said that it's, it's a popular thing. It is beneficial to a sector of, the, of, the, of Ghanaians who would not have seen the light of day. But when you are implementing this measure, it should be targeted. It shouldn't be a blanket thing to the extent you know, that it covers even those who are capable and are paying. It's a mixed it's, testing. It's been a pleasure. And then you mix it with maybe loan facilities and others. It's been a pleasure having <coughs> you on the show. Thank you for coming. And I, I hope you, you spend more time talking now that you are out of government. Mr. Seth Imanotepe, Minister, former was... Minister of Finance. Thank you. He's, this Thank is you a tax much. consultant. Thank you. What's the name of your tax consultant? <laughs> Tax and PFN, not just tax. Oh, I thought you make it take and cool. <laughs> <laughs> tax and what? Tax PFM Africa. <laughs> so it's called PFM Tax. Yeah. Powerful man. Thank you for being on the show, Seth Tekwe. And thank you for listening. Uh, my name is did I say listening? Thank you for watching. My name is Bernard uh, Avle. This has been the point of view. Keep watching City TV and good night. about the midweek is that the weekend is slowly drawing close so welcome to 30 minutes right here on city tv my name is aj Aquaco, and i'm here with the gorgeous melissa ward welcome back guys and of course we have trending conversations for you and as we like to start it off with use our hashtag hashtag 